If we can uh, get anybody else who is planning on joining us to sit down and those who haven't yet come in to come in, that would be marvelous. We want to make the most of this extraordinary panel to talk about an issue that uh, if it hadn't occurred to you before Pam Geller got up this morning, um, I'm sure it has since you heard her uh, impressed upon you just how important is the topic of radical Islam versus our national security. Uh, I'm Frank Gaffney, I run an organization called the Center for Security Policy and I'm really pleased to be able to be here and to be moderating this program and to be with you uh, for one that has a, a similar kind of uh, subject matter but specifically focused on what's happening with Israel and the Middle East um, after lunch. Uh, but we're gonna start this, uh, this program with a broader focus today, and, and many of the themes are, are ones that Pamela has addressed with you earlier and that will, I'm sure, be featured uh, very, very effectively here and then after lunch in the panel that Ken Blackwell is moderating. Um, I'm gonna say just a few words before introducing my esteemed colleagues to sort of set the stage, and, and I thought maybe I'd start with some definitions. Uh, for example, is radical Islam an appropriate term for us to be using to talk about a threat to our national security? Well, I'm gonna argue that it's not so much radical Islam that is the problem. It is a doctrine that Islam considers to be orthodoxy, namely Sharia, that is the problem. It's not radical uh, in any sense other than it's crazy and dangerous to those who don't follow it. But the term radical Islam suggests that we really only need to be worried about a sort of handful or at least relatively small number of people who are extremists. Um, who are somehow on the fringe, or as we've been told by successive presidents of the United States, really unconnected altogether from Islam itself. I personally don't believe that's true, and our, our colleagues can speak to their views on the subject. Maybe we can have a discussion about it and, and um, look forward to your Q&A on that. But I'm gonna offer to you as, as uh, as we did in a book that we've published that is available outside, each of us is an author of at least one thing, and I want to commend to you all of uh, the books that are made available to you here, but, but one that I, I really particularly am proud of is this one called Sharia, the Threat to America. Uh, General Boykin was uh, one of the co-authors of it, uh, Tom Trento, who is out here somewhere, <clears throat> and a number of others, uh, 19 of us all together, put it together to try to help clarify what is fundamentally animating the enemy and, and who that enemy is. And as the events of the past week have made clear, it's not just Al-Qaeda, or certainly not just Al-Qaeda someplace else, uh, or even Al-Qaeda and its franchises. Uh, as, as I think Pamela said very clearly, it is a global jihad. It is about holy war and bringing it to us, and it is that that really constitutes the threat to our national security. Let me also suggest that we need to define our terms with respect to what national security means. Uh, for many of us, particularly of a certain age, we think of national security as, you know, the enemies that are somehow arrayed against this country elsewhere, mostly nations with big armies and massive threatening capabilities, uh, nuclear, perhaps, certainly other kinds. Well, national security in our day is obviously much more than that, much more complicated, and much more challenging to protect. It involves not just enemies of the nation state variety, it involves, as I suggested a moment ago, people who don't necessarily hew to any nation at all. In fact, they, they believe themselves part of, a, of an ummah, a transnational global population, um, a, 
a Muslim nation, if you will. There are others as well. Uh, many of them are associated in one way or another with this um, doctrine of Sharia that are able to use not massive armies and, and not long-range ballistic missiles to threaten us, but a host of asymmetric weapons from planes being flown into skyscrapers to pressure cookers filled with nails and uh, BBs to, God forbid, weapons of mass destruction of a rather more prosaic kind, like chemical weapons or, or biological weapons. They're, in other words, threats that have now evolved in various places around the world. How many of you had ever heard of Chechnya before? Well, I'm sure in this audience many of you had, but, but most Americans certainly couldn't have found it on a map and probably are pretty clueless as to why anybody from there would want to kill anybody from here. Unless you understand the complexion of jihad and the adherence to Sharia that commands it. And that in fact is bringing people from all over the world to wage holy war against people like us. Including here in the United States. So homeland security is now clearly very much part of national security. Asymmetric threats is part of what we have to contend with, as well as the traditional threats. And I'll conclude by simply saying that my own feeling about it is that we have under, sadly, the Bush administration and most especially under the Obama administration, not only failed to understand these key realities, and most especially the fact that among the jihadists and their asymmetric threats against us is a phenomenon that's gone almost completely unnoticed and certainly unaddressed. And that is what the characters who feature prominently in this book, The Muslim Brotherhood, call civilization jihad by which they mean not to eschew violence, but to use it when it will be most effective. And in the meantime, to pursue jihad, to pursue exactly the same goals as say Al-Qaeda or Hezbollah or Hamas or the Iranian regime or Palestinian Islamic Jihad or Jamaat Islamiyah or any of the other guys that we associate with the violent kind of Jihad, namely imposing Sharia worldwide and reconstituting a caliphate to rule according to it. But until the conditions are right in places like, well, where they started, Egypt or here, not to use violence, but to use more stealthy, subversive techniques to attack the civil society, institutions, and governing agencies. In the words of um, the Muslim Brotherhood, to destroy us from within by our hands, that is a whole nother piece of the challenge that we face from not radical Islam, but from the orthodoxy of Islam, Sharia, and from the asymmetric means by which it is being wielded against us here in the United States, as well as elsewhere. So with that as kind of backdrop for a conversation about what are we doing about these threats and what must we do about these threats. I'm delighted to be able to introduce to you, uh, and I'll do it in turn, my three colleagues. Uh, Bill Murray is an old friend and comrade in arms, a man who has been fighting successive enemies of this country in what I think of as the war for the free world, going back now decades. Uh, he spent a lot of time contending with and helping to counter the last totalitarian ideology we faced, 
that was bent on our destruction, namely Soviet communism. By both helping people understand the threat that it represented, uh, helping the victims of communism, and helping, among other things, because he understood what a powerful asymmetric weapon it could be for good, printing and distributing Bibles in the Soviet Union. Uh, Bill has gone on to help wage with similar effect um, the current fight against today's totalitarian ideology bent on our destruction. I would argue it's Sharia. Uh, through a variety of means as well, uh, notably by helping victims of it, Christians most especially, uh, in the Middle East and elsewhere, and certainly helping the rest of us understand the threat that we are confronting. He is the author of seven books, including My Life Without God, which is also available outside, and it's a great pleasure to have, welcome Bill Murray. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you uh, so much, Frank. And uh, uh, to start off with an unabashed commercial, Frank was Undersecretary of Defense, Assistant, Assistant Undersecretary of Defense during the Reagan administration. And he and I will be uh, taking a security uh, uh, tour of Israel starting September 30th. For those of you who are interested, we'll be going to the Golan Heights, on to an IDF base, uh, into the so-called West Bank, which is actually Samaria and visiting some of the settlements, which are actually big cities. Uh, and uh, I look forward to being with you on that, uh, Frank. I, I certainly do. I'm going to go back to uh, the second attack on the World Trade Center for just a couple of minutes before I, I move on. Uh, I want to tell you what I was doing that day. Uh, I was on I-95. I live in Fredericksburg, uh, Virginia, which is about 50 miles south of the capital. I can't afford to live any closer. That's for the establishment people. It's an inside joke for those in Frank. Um, <clears throat> but, but anyway, I was driving in, uh, and I had a news conference that day with Senator Brownback, um, Congressman Wolf, and several others. Uh, we were in a last-ditch effort in order to try to pass what was then called the Sudan Peace Act. And what the Sudan Peace Act did was it uh, uh, would severely punish the government of the Sudan, the radical uh, uh, Islamic dictatorship of uh, the Sudan from the continued, which was continuing to murder uh, Christians in the South, as well as to steal their oil assets um, and uh, we had passed this just boom through the House. Everybody was in favor of it. It got over to the Senate, and we had more than enough votes in the Senate to pass this bill punishing um, the government of, of, of the Sudan and, to, and, and hopefully to stop them from their continuing genocide of the Christians of the South. And the bill was spiked by the Bush White House. They called over the Senate leaders and said, we don't want this. It interferes with the White House's uh, uh, ability to conduct foreign affairs, and uh, we don't want it. And we were going to this press conference to make a last-ditch effort to try to overcome the Bush White House's spiking of this bill to help the Christians of the southern Sudan. What is significant about that? is that uh, I heard about the first aircraft hitting um, and then the second aircraft hitting. I, I knew what it was immediately. I, I called uh, a gentleman who we both know who was an assistant to the president at the White House. And I'm on the phone with him to the White House. And I said, we cannot respond to this by arresting people. We, we are at war. When, 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 how many attacks does it take on the World Trade Center? How many ships have to be sunk? How many embassies have to be blown up before somebody realizes we're at war? It was at that point that the gentleman dropped the telephone and fled the White House because the, uh, uh, it, was, there was, it was imminent that there was going to be an attack either on the White House or Capitol Hill. At that point in time, I had just approaching the 14th Street Bridge 
uh, on the Virginia side when American Flight 77 struck the Pentagon. I literally felt the impact on my Jeep. I want you just to think a minute about the significance of that and what was going through my mind. I was on my way to a news conference with senators and congressmen in order to, over try, over, to, to try to overcome the administration's opposition to a bill punishing a radical Islamic government. And we had Saudi Arabian citizens flying airplanes into buildings, which we didn't know for a few days. But I was, from that point on, um, really redirected in, in a lot of my efforts. Although from the fall of the Soviet Union, when I had been involved there, I already knew the threat. I had a conversation in Moscow with a former communist who told me shortly after the great collapse, he said, you will be sorry because you have unleashed a monster. And I said, what do you mean? He said, we had the stands under our firm control. He said, you will regret the day that they were loosed. And we have. We have. Um, you know, I, I got extremely frustrated after 9-11. I know I'm talking about a personal story rather than, than general things, but I'm, I'm going to continue for j just a moment. I got very frustrated almost immediately by the whitewashing of Saudi Arabia. Fourteen of the attackers were not only Saudi citizens, they were well-educated Saudi citizens, I believe most of them with, with, uh, um, with college degrees. I wrote an article, and in that article I put, you know, we will whitewash Saudi Arabia and we'll go attack some poor third world nation somewhere and blame them because we can't deal with the root of the evil, which are the financiers of, the, uh, of, of what has happened. Um, at the end of 30 days, I was so frustrated, I actually purchased an ad in the Washington Times, which somebody placed on their editorial page. It was the first, last, and only ad that ever appeared in the Washington Times editorial page. That uh, basically it said, who is this nation? And I, I listed all the attributes that had been given to the Taliban of Afghanistan. And then at the bottom of the ad, I said, it's Saudi Arabia. It's Saudi Arabia. You know, we, we are 12 years later, and the Saudis have just spent so far $2 billion to overthrow the last government in the Middle East where Christians are safe. And our government is helping them. Our government is helping them. We, we, we have become, and the UK, surrogates for the governments of Qatar and Saudi Arabia doing their will in the Middle East. What's dangerous about this is like any other enemy, they view uh, any type of apology, any type of, of cooperation as actual weakness. And I think that we have faced that in the last couple of days. We have a bandwagon effect of Islam in the West. A bandwagon effect. It, it is just like, um, uh, you know, you, you have politicians running and somebody comes in with the biggest bandwagon and the loudest bandwagon and it's making the no most noise and people start to jump on that bandwagon even though that politician may not be the best candidate. We just found that out last year. Had a big, loud bandwagon, didn't we? Well, this is, this is the problem that we're facing with radical Islam today, is more and more and more people are jumping onto the bandwagon because they now see it as the inevitable defeat of the West. And you have individuals that were Muslims who were marginal. And by marginal, I mean they were living day to day uh, yes, they believe in, in this. Yes, they send money through, through whatever and it winds up in the hands of terrorists. But they weren't going to go out and blow things up themselves. 
but you'll get more and more and more of those people jumping on the bandwagon as we suffer more and more defeats and as we retreat further and further and further away from, from facing the enemy of, of, uh, of, of Islam. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. I, I went a little bit too long. I, uh, I, I was watching the clock, but not well enough. I think that, that, I hope that somebody will ask a few questions during, this, during our, our, our period of questioning, uh, particularly about the Middle East, the ramifications that we have on that in the United States, and particularly the State Department students of, of new mission in light of the last two days with our State Department saying we need to bring as many Islamic students to the United States as we possibly can in order to teach them our ways. And we need this, to leave it up to the Saudis to determine which of them will be which uh, that are admitted. Uh, Bill, thank you for that, and, and most especially for making the point about um, Muslims who are on the fence. Because it's something I wanted to say, and I, we may get a discussion going about this. I, I personally believe that uh, one of the reasons for using this term Sharia is it helps differentiate between Muslims who are clearly a problem and some who aren't, at least not yet, because they don't embrace it or they don't practice it or they're not trying to impose it on the rest of us. So I, I think this is a critical point because they're in play. And if they go the wrong way, it just enormously compounds the danger that the rest of them who do embrace Sharia already represent. Um, I'm very pleased to rec uh, recognize next Jonathan Matusitz. He is a professor here in uh, Central Florida, the University of Central Florida. His specialization, which is really important to this particular topic, is on the nexus between terrorism and communications. And I think, as Pamela said so well earlier in the day, uh, this, is a, this is happening in a lot of different respects. On the one hand, we're witnessing the spinning of our own media about the threat, telling us what we can know and what we can't know about it, for instance. Uh, but I think Jonathan has also done some very interesting work, including in his book, Terrorism and Communication, A Critical Introduction, and in a lecture that caught my eye the other day, um, how culture shapes terrorism. To talk about the tools that are being used, communications tools, if you will, by our enemies to bring Muslims to jihad. Uh, and it's terrific to have you with us. Thank you very much for joining us. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Frank. Thank you for being here. It's an honor to speak to my church. Uh, I'm a faculty at UCF, and one of the classes that I teach is terrorism and communication. There is an institution that's based in Santa Monica, California, called RAND, R-A-N-D, which stands for Research and Development, and it's an institution that studies terrorism worldwide. According to RAND, from 2000 to 2010, 96% of the victims of terrorism were victims of Islamic terrorism, 96%. So when my colleagues tell me that Islam is a religion of peace, I tell them that Islam is a religion of pieces. Peace of body here, peace of body there. Now this panel is about radical Islam. I would take the word radical out of the equation. The problem is Islam. As you can hear, I'm not from Florida, I'm from Belgium, like Dr. Evil, that's from Belgium. I've been living here for 13 years. In 1990, according to the CIA World Factbook, in 1990, there were 29 million Islamic immigrants in Europe. That was 23 years ago. Today, it's almost 55 million. One of the duties of Islam is to conquer foreign land whether it's through jihad or stealth jihad, what we call civilization jihad, the duty of a true Muslim is to conquer foreign land, to establish a caliphate. A caliphate is a grand Islamic state. So the whole world should become Muslim and all countries will impose Sharia. And Sharia is a totalitarian lifestyle. 
It's going to tell you how to dress, uh, the way you talk, the way you, the way you walk. Women have fewer rights. They have Sharia in my country. It's not in the Constitution, but it's in the schools. Uh, they have no-go zones. In Brussels, Belgium, they have no-go zones. A no-go zone is a zone uh, that is occupied by Muslims where even the police are afraid to go. And during Ramadan, the police cannot be spotted eating a sandwich. It's too offensive. So do you get the big picture? Muslims are telling us what to do. I think that prevention is better than cure, and we don't want that in the United States. Now, you've heard of the Cathedral of Cologne. Who knows what I'm talking about, the Cathedral of Cologne? They're building a mosque right next to it that says twice as large and twice as big, next to the Cathedral of Cologne. In England, they have 87 Sharia courts headed by an Islamic judge, which means that the husband can beat his wife. In the United States, we have no Sharia courts, not yet, unless we take action. There is a movement called ALAC, American Laws for American Courts, and it's a movement that opposes Sharia. Now, it doesn't say Sharia in its bill, it says foreign laws, no foreign laws. Now, the state of Oklahoma made a mistake. Uh, they wanted to, to oppose Sharia, and they said no Sharia law. They were sued by the Supreme Court. So, if I were to give you solutions as to what we can do, is basically to have no foreign laws. Right? The place to take it is to the local level. The White House has been infiltrated by the Muslim Brotherhood, so the White House is not the way to go. The place to go is to go to the, lo to the local people. Before 9-11, there were 1,200 mosques in the United States. Today it's 2,200. This is no coincidence. Even though they killed 3,000 people on that fateful day, they will continue invading our country. Frank, like you said, in our country, it's not so much a wolf, it's a wolf in sheep's clothing, what we call stealth jihad, infiltrating our education, infiltrating our cultural system, imposing political correctness and hate crime bills. If they can do it in Europe, if they can do it in Canada, they can do it here. Speaking of Canada, in 2011, they passed a law forbidding anyone criticizing any religion. So you cannot criticize Christianity, Judaism, Islam. If you do, you will be fined. And if you refuse to pay the fine, you'll go to jail. If they can do it in Canada, if they can do it in Europe, they can do it here. Our first and second amendments are our, our last chances to survive. In academia, rumor has it that most professors are liberals. No, no. I would say that 70% of faculty are liberal, 25% are conservative, and 5% are conservative and openly conservative. So it's very difficult just to find people who are willing to, to blow the whistle on the problem and to tell the truth. You know what I tell people? I'm a conservative professor and I love it. Now, we do have Muslims who are on the fence. Uh, the problem is that they're not the problem, but they're not the solution either. A lot of them do not criticize their brothers and sisters uh, who are evil, who are just committing terrorist acts. It's out of fear. In the United States, we do have cultural Muslims, many Muslims who do not want to hurt us. Uh, again, they're not the problem, but they're not the solution either. Uh, we are the solution. We are the ones to, 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 to uphold the principles of our country, to preserve our values. So we are the one to try to, to be like this church. Uh, just like we have a rise of Islam, we have a demise of Christianity. And this is felt strongly in Europe. In a country like Sweden, in 1900, 90% of the Swedes went to church. Today it's 3%. In England, where you have the Anglican Church, in 1900, 90% of British went to church. Today, it's 10%. And of course, Muslims are taking over. And the problem is so bad that a country like France, a country like England, must agree to polygamy. 
because they have so many Muslims. In France, you're looking at eight million Islamic immigrants, and you have a lot of polygamous families. It's safety by numbers. And they procreate like mushrooms after the rain. And the, <laughs> all right. the fertility rate among Muslim families in Europe is seven to eight kids. Just like Muslims are having a lot of children and slowly replacing European culture. The average non-Muslim European family has 1.6 children. For a culture to survive, for a culture to be sustained, the fertility rate needs to be 2.1 children per woman in her lifetime. Most European countries do not procreate anymore, they just don't. Spain has a fertility rate of 1.3 children per family. The problem is so bad that the Spanish government is issuing baby checks how about I give you 2,000 euros so you can have babies? Apparently, it's not incentivizing. In the United States, it's 2.5 million Muslims. It's only 0.6% of the population from the same source, the CIA World Factbook. So how can they invade the United States? Well, unlike Europe, where it's safety in numbers, in the United States, it's civilization jihad, which is best exemplified by the Muslim Brotherhood. We should be afraid of the Muslim Brotherhood. Osama bin Laden was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. Hamas was, is the brainchild of the Muslim Brotherhood. But somehow they have successfully passed themselves as moderate. They have convinced a lot of Americans that they're not a terrorist organization. Well, the difference between Islamism and Islam is like the difference between a wolf and a wolf in sheep's clothing. You have people in military fatigues and you have people in a suit. Different methods, same objective. That's what people need to understand. Thank you. Jonathan, thank you. Uh, well, it is often said that a certain person doesn't need any introduction. She's already had one today. So um, I'm happy only to say about Pam Geller that uh, she is a force of nature. And she's on our side, which is uh, a very good thing. Um, she's a good friend. She has been a real leader in the effort to prevent what we're talking about from actually coming to pass in this country. And through her courage and through her vision and through her efforts and through the inspiration that she represents, uh, I think we're less far along uh, this trajectory uh, that, as Jonathan has said, we can trace, make no mistake about it, in other Western democracies than would otherwise be the case. Um, I think she'd be the first to tell you it's not slow enough and it needs to be turned around and for that purpose, we'll turn the mic over to you. Pamela, welcome, it's good to have you. Thank you, Frank, thank you. You know, when President Obama was asked who was his most trusted ally across the world, his favorite world leader, he responded by saying President Erdogan, who was the Prime Minister of Turkey. Prime Minister Erdogan, who said to Obama, to Frank's point, there is no extreme Islam, there is no moderate Islam, Islam is Islam. And I have to agree about this radical the word radical. Now, people say don't split hairs and we have to get the message out. If we're working so hard to get the message out, can we get it right? And it's a problem. Words mean something. Language is very important. And it is authentic Islam. It is pure Islam. As for the moderates, yeah, I do believe they're staying on the sidelines. And any time a Muslim comes out, any time, and speaks to it, I remember with the Christmas Day bomber, I'm sure you remember the Christmas Day bomber, the Christmas balls bomber. He had the bomb in his underwear. He sat, on uh, he sat directly over the fuel tanks, seat 19A to make sure you get the biggest blast. He sought to detonate it as they were coming into Detroit to make sure they would kill as many people on the ground. When he was being arraigned in Detroit, a very small group, albeit a very small group, but a group nonetheless, of Muslims, stood up to protest um, at the courthouse. And within 24 hours, the leader of that group, the organizer, was issued, there were three death fatwas issued on his head. And they have to live in that community. 
So it's really very frightening. And the tide is not going that way. The tide is not going that way. The culture is not going that way. I can't stress culture enough, which is why all the activism that I do is dead in the middle of the culture. I d generally don't get behind candidates because look, the bottom line is politics is the rear view mirror. They're going like this. They're not gonna do anything that will serve, not to serve their reelection. We know, even in the GOP, of the three basic rules, the third one is do not address the Muslim issue. It will destroy you. So we have allowed that to happen by our silence. Silence is sanction. And I submit to you that in this silence, you, it, is the, it, it is the sanction of the victim. You know, uh, Ayn Rand said, um, evil is made possible by the sanction you give it. Withdraw your sanction. You must withdraw your Your silence is sanction. Uh, and it's very scary to speak to William's point about religious minorities. I mean, the rise in the persecution of religious minorities under President Obama, who has been pursuing a pro-jihadist policy. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I'm not overstating it, ladies and gentlemen. In Egypt, you see what's going on. And it's, yesterday, while covering Boston, you know, there was a pro-Muslim Brotherhood rally, and they filmed these pro-Muslim Brotherhood um, protesters shooting shooting at pro-freedom demonstrators and beating the living daylights out of them. This is the poisonous fruit of Obama's catastrophic foreign policy. He owns Egypt. He owns it. He invited the Muslim Brotherhood to his speech June 9, 2009. They were banned. Mubarak was livid. And then mid-level uh, officials in the Obama administration were meeting with Muslim Brotherhood um, uh, leaders uh, in Egypt that led up to the takeover. And Libya, what are we doing in Libya? We don't get our oil from Libya. You may not like Gaddafi, I certainly don't like him, but there's worse. And so now you have a jihadist regime in Libya. And you see it reverb, there's a reverb. What's a reverb? Mali. Mali fell, fell to Al Qaeda. And you see Tunisia, these moderate Muslim countries are falling like dominoes. Because like Osama bin Laden said, the strong horse. And I don't believe that we're perceived as a strong horse anymore. So to William's point, what does Obama do with this increased persecution of Coptic Christians and Christians in Nigeria and Christians in Indonesia and Buddhists in Thailand? He actually removes from the State Department report, there's a section that reports on religious persecution of religious minorities, he removes the section. So if it's not there and you don't know about it, it's not happening. As righteous people, this is unacceptable. And to the professor's good point, you must listen to him more acutely and, mo and more carefully than even to us. Because what we're witnessing in Europe is what Hitler could not achieve. Uh, Norway, I think, is, I think there are a thousand Jews left that are fleeing. I mean, Norway will be Judenrein. And Malmo certainly is. Now we have 100,000 French Jews fleeing France. And as you know, with the Jewish day school shooting, when they opened fire, when a, a jihadist opened fire, Mera opened fire and um, had a camera on his chest. And he pulled a little blonde girl's hair by the head and he filmed the whole shooting. And, and it went up online to the cheers of jihadists across the world. Language means something. People say Al-Qaeda, it's just Al-Qaeda. What does Al-Qaeda mean in Arabic? It means headquarters. It means CENTCOM. It's the military wing of the global jihad. And you must pay attention to language. And you must speak correctly. And you must learn everything. Because it is up to you. It's up to you. No one is going to save you. And if you think this is some battle, that I love when they say they tie it to Israel, you know, um, which I find amusing. And I'm sure we'll discuss it at the, at, at the, at the Israel panel because it's outrageous. This is 1,400 years of jihadi wars, land appropriations, cultural annihilations, and enslavements. 1,400 years, 275 mil million victims, and that's a low estimate. And Obama's favorite ally, President Erdogan, is now converting the most exquisite, the most beautiful, the most revered church, the Hagia Sophia, into a mosque. And the world says nothing. And World Heritage says nothing. And the UN says nothing. Of course the UN says nothing. It's being driven by the largest world body. 
The largest world body is the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. It's made up of 56 Muslim countries plus the Palestinian Authority. And their objective is to impose Sharia on the Western world, on the free world. And here, for the first time in history, you had a president, the President of the United States, signing a resolution, 1618, that seeks to criminalize the defamation of religion. Listen, it's not religion because you see what they say about Christians and you see what they say about the Jews. It's Islam. We don't seek to criminalize somebody saying, uh, you know, we'd have to put the whole media in jail for, for, for blaspheming Christianity. Let's be serious. So in closing, uh, it's important that you learn, that you learn to speak and to use the right words and, and to get the message out. That's what, we have to leapfrog over the enemy media because the enemy media is the largest weapon in the arsenal of the enemy. And so this is the objective. If you come away with this, with anything, it's to start talking. And, to, and when there is a rally, like we had a free speech rally, you go. You go, you wanna go out to lunch? Go out to lunch, you make that rally. They're afraid of you. You know, that's why we have the Second Amendment. People say, oh, it's to protect our, our goods and our home. No, no, no. The Second Amendment was instituted solely to make sure that the government was afraid of you and you were not afraid of the government. Thank you. Well done. Um, now, I should know the answer to this question, but are there microphones? For the audience. Yeah, Are there yeah. some? Oh, good. Okay. Does anybody have any questions for this extraordinary panel? It seems as though we do. Um, we'll start in the back and then we'll move you forward. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Sir, go ahead. Yes. I know that our so-called president is a Muslim. I want to know your all's, uh, this question of mine is, how close do you believe that this man is to be making Sharia law, law of the land in the United States. How close do you think he is to be doing this? Who would like to uh, take a first cut at that, Pamela? I want to just say a couple things about Obama as a Muslim. Don't get caught up in this. Uh, because the fact that he was born a Muslim, because his father was a Muslim, I understand. The fact that his stepfather was a Muslim and adopted him, I understand. The fact that he grew up in Indonesia, a Muslim country, studied Quran from the ages of six to 12, I understand. I understand all that. But the point is, if he is, when someone asks you that, because they're looking to pigeonhole you, they're looking to pigeonhole you, this is what you say. You say, I don't know what's in his heart. That's not the question. The question is, if he is or he isn't, what would he be doing differently? That, that's the answer. As far as imposing Sharia law, it's, he's not gonna come down with his gavel, Sharia is here. We see the Department of Justice has become a de facto legal arm for the Muslim Brotherhood. We see the Department of Justice sued a small town in Minnesota because one of the teachers, brand new teacher, wanted to go on the Hajj. The Hajj is an obligation you must make under Islam to go to Mecca one time in your entire life. And so she goes, I wanna go. She's a young woman, they said, well, you're our only math lab teacher, we can't lose you. One month, she wanted to leave. They said no. She left anyway. Department of Justice took up the case, sued, won, and they had to pay $77,000. These small towns can't afford it. Now, I'm not gonna give you the litany of cases, but believe me, there is a litany of cases. And even the abridgment of free speech, when he says, when he stood up in front of the UN and said, uh, the future does not belong to those that slander the prophet, that's Sharia. That, that's Sharia. So he doesn't do it by dictum. He does it by infusing it into the culture. And that's how you have to stealthily fight back to. Could I just say, I, I completely agree with what Pamela just said. It, it really is important to focus on what he's doing, not what might be his motivations. And what he is doing is plenty bad enough. And, and let me add one other example, because it's directly relevant to the conversation that we're starting to have. I, I was on Fox briefly this morning and mentioned it there. We've learned in the space of the past, what is it, 12 hours? It seems like days, but 24 maybe, that the FBI in actually sat down with and interviewed the elder of the two Chechen brothers about a year ago. They didn't see anything wrong with the guy. Did you know that the FBI's 
training program has now been purged, literally, of information that might have helped them identify him as a jihadist. Did you know that the Department of Homeland Security, under the dictates of Muslim Brotherhood operatives that the president and people like Tom Perez, who, by the way, he wants us to now have anointed as the new Secretary of Labor, have been promoting into positions, in some cases, on the payroll of the government at your expense, in other cases as advisors, but under something called the Countering Violent Extremism Working Group of the Department of Homeland Security, which has, at my count, at least three Muslim Brotherhood operatives on it. They have promoted guidelines that say, from now on, just to be sure that nothing is done, going to Pamela's point about offending Muslims, you must consult with community partners before you use any federal funds for training or hiring trainers to train in countering violent extremism. I'm of a certain age, Bill, Cold War. If we had allowed the KGB, the Soviet intelligence services, to tell us what we could know about Soviet communism, what we could say, what we could do about Soviet communism, which is essentially what we're doing by putting the Muslim Brotherhood's community partners <clears throat> in charge, it wouldn't have worked out, folks. That Cold War would not have come out as it did, and this increasingly hot one wouldn't either. Anybody else, or can we move to another question? Pausing, good. Um, can you bring the mic up? Let's see if we can grab one of these folks up here, please. Oh, there's a mic here, good. This lady right here, be good. My question is, is um, what are your thoughts on the Saudi that was the person of interest, along with the unexpected um, visit to the president from the Saudi officials in this last two days, and also the vice president of CARE from Texas that is now the leader of the rebel group in Syria? Great questions. Yeah, Anybody want to take I, I want to touch on, uh, first let me go to the to the that Muslim Brotherhood situation, um, you know, uh, I don't know. I think Frank may be aware of it, but not too many people in here. Uh, there was a um, uh, a lengthy article in the Wall Street Journal a few days ago that the United States had determined that the wrong group of Muslims was going to take over in Syria, and as a result, we were going to slow down our aid and allow the war to continue. That we didn't want a victor that we were going to allow the slaughter there to, to continue, um, which I find just beyond disgusting. But uh, uh, the, the situation in Syria, um, you know, there are over 10% of the population is Christian. The Christians are feeling the brunt of this. The sniper rifles that have been furnished uh, by, particularly by the UK and paid for by the Saudi government are being used to kill priests as they walk down the, the, the street. Um, there was a church blown up in Damascus uh, five days ago. It was never reported on, on the media. We won't touch anything. Anything that, uh, that the uh, Islamists do there, uh, we, we don't report on. We just, we, we just let it go. One of the, the serious problems that we have is that Christians in this country are so busy uh, seeing Christian persecution as not being able to pass out Christmas cards in school that we're allowing our brothers and sisters in Christ to be murdered all over the world. And, and we need to, to do something. We need to stop this. This has gotten so bad that Jewish leaders have come out and asked if we're nuts. Um, I, I just, um, uh, there is a Dennis Prager, uh, who is, was a Jewish activist and headed the organization uh, for students to help Soviet Jewry uh, during when the Soviet Union I existed. And, and he, is, he just has basically come out. He, he wrote an article a short time ago and he said, I don't understand it. When, when the Jews were persecuted, every single synagogue in the United States had a banner that said, stop, stop, uh, save the Soviet Jews. He said, I'll admit this, the, the Christians in the Soviet Union were treated worse. And priests and, and uh, pastors would come to our meetings to help the Jews and would do nothing for the Christians that were in the Soviet dungeons. 
And now we have the same situation. And, and we don't reach out. Our pastors don't talk about it. We don't talk about it. You want to stop radical Islam in the United States? You want to stop Sharia in the United States? Here's how to do it. Start talking about the victims of Islam. Yeah. That's how you do it. We need every church in the United States should have a banner out said that says, save the Christians of the Middle East. Every church should have a banner out there that says, don't allow St. Paul and St. Peter's churches to be blown up in the Middle East. That's what we need. As long as we've, we get in these intellectual discussions of the problem, we're, we're, we, need, we need the same thing that the left always use. They always march out a starving child and say, here's, here's a starving child. We need $50 billion to feed perfectly healthy people that don't need the food because of the... We need to bring out our starving kids, except in our case, they really exist. Bill, thank you. This uh, was a very important intervention, but not entirely responsive. Let me, let me just say a word about the two things you've asked. I'm not quite sure what the status is of the, uh, the deportation of a fellow by the name of Abdul Rahman Al-Harbi. As a number of our colleagues have pointed out, uh, the Al-Harbi clan in Saudi Arabia is a very radical operation. But just one clue, if Abdul Rahman sounds familiar to you, it's because the blind sheikh, the guy who tried to blow up the World Trade Center the first time, is named Omar Abdul Rahman. And speaking to Pamela's concerns about our president, one of the things that I fully expect will wake up one fine morning and discover is that Abdul Rahman has been sent back to Egypt to serve out the rest of his life sentence, mind you, but uh, it probably won't happen. On the Hito business, um, the vice president, uh, he's actually now the opposition prime minister um, of Syria, is a fellow, I believe it's Ghassan Hito, who was until recently a top Muslim Brotherhood operative in Dallas, Texas which tells you two important things. One is, as Pamela has pointed out, we're trying, or Bill, we're trying to put in charge of another Middle Eastern country, Syria, the Muslim Brotherhood, at best. And maybe it'll work out that it's Al-Qaeda instead, but either way, it's not gonna be good for them or for us. And then secondly, we do have Muslim Brotherhood operations in this country. Just a fun fact to know and tell, I understand that the president whom, as Pamela pointed out, we helped put into place in Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood, Mohamed Morsi, was recruited into the Muslim Brotherhood by a large, indeed the first Muslim Brotherhood front in the United States, the Muslim Students Association in the University of Southern California. This is real, folks. This is a strategic war in which civilization, jihadist, asymmetric, subversive, seditious techniques are being used. Maybe else can quickly? I, can I just say one thing about El sure. Harbi? First of all, I, it is not a coincidence that when he was being grilled, that Senator Kerry, I mean Secretary of State Kerry, uh, who was scheduled to have a meeting with the Saudis, made it a closed door meeting. I know the press there knows who's out of joint about it, but I, I, I'd like to know what was discussed at that meeting and we won't find out. I also, uh, at the same time, the very next day, President Obama made an unscheduled trip to a meeting that uh, the Saudi foreign minister uh, was in Washington and we don't know what was discussed at that meeting. I am not at all satisfied that Al Harbi is not involved, not at the least. And the fact that the Saudi um, vice council went to visit him. There are pictures, because the Arab press is running these pictures like, look, you know, here's our man with our man. Yeah, and I don't believe it's just these two. All those bombs in, in Boston, all that military grade hardware, the, the IEDs, the grenades, that was a war zone. I don't believe those two acted alone. I cannot believe that he's being deported. Oh, get this on national security violations. So he, ha he, has, he has some terror-linked problems.
problems that they're not discussing now. Because it became such a brouhaha after Emerson said it on Hannity, that's how the story got out. And of course, independent sources at the Pentagon confirmed, even though Napolitano said it was unworthy of an answer when queried about it, I think by one of Wolf's people, right? Um, the fact is, they'll use another name, they'll say his visa expired. But I'm telling you, that's very, very smelly, and I think, there's some, I think there's more to that story than meets the eye. And of course, you're absolutely right, of course this is so reminiscent of what happened after 9-11. And that? the first lady visited him, did you know that? The first lady visited the first Saudi national who was apprehended in the Boston Jihad bombing. You think about that. Wow. Did you have something, Jonathan, quickly? I'd like to say something very important. When President Bush was running the show, the words terrorism and Islam were still used in the same sentence. If you read the 9-11 report, the words jihad and Islam were used hundreds of times. Ever since Barack Obama has run our country, the words Islam and terrorism are no longer used in the same sentence. In June of 2009, a, a black Baptist Christian converted to Islam and his name was Carlos Bledsoe, and he became Abdul Hakim Muhammad. He killed an American citizen at a military recruiting office in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, he was convicted, and he wrote a letter to the judge admitting that he did it for Allah, and that he was affiliated to Al-Qaeda. They, they didn't call it terrorism, they called it a drive-by shooting. Sounds like Al Capone. In November of 2009, five months later, Major Nidal Hassan killed 13 people in Fort Hood, in a military base in Texas. Before killing all those people, he was shouting, Allahu Akbar, Allah the greatest. What did, what did they call that? Terrorism? No, workplace violence. See, that's one way just to destroy our country, political correctness, communication. We call that hegemony. And hegemony means invisible power. You need to infiltrate our culture slowly changing minds. And the, it's and not the political is, correctness, it's Sharia, just for knowing. Yeah. It's the implement, implementation of Sharia. And, and the practical effect of that over time is that you do communicate, to use your word, to the enemy, not whatever we describe it as, political correctness or, or multiculturalism or, or paper tiger. sensitivity to diversity. You communicate submission which is, of course, as you know, the literal meaning of Islam, and they must respond to that by redoubling their effort to make you feel subdued. Could I just mention, just quickly, um, I believe it is actually the case, and I documented it in a course we did at MuslimBrotherhoodInAmerica.com, that this process very much began in earnest under the Bush administration, not just under Obama, with, first of all, using the euphemism terrorism for jihad exclusively and segregating it increasingly from Islam. Yes, ma'am, or sir, who, where are you? I see the microphone, but I don't hand it to one of those folks. There you go. Thank you. Um, like many other people in here, we're all involved with different groups, okay, that are in opposition to Sharia and Islam. I'm a chapter leader for Act for America, and I work closely with the United West. I brought a number of speakers in that I consider to be notable, uh, Tom Trento, Claire M. Lopez, and I'm hopeful that some of you might come to speak to my chapter. Recently, I had Dr. Zudi Jasser in trying to get a viewpoint from the other side. And Dr. Zudi Jasser is considered to be a devout Muslim that argues for our side on the right. And um, I also have, potentially, the Ahmadiyyan Muslim community, which may come to speak at my chapter. And these are two views that are uh, Muslim views that are, might be more acceptable. Certainly, Dr. Zudi Jasser has been given a positive light. Acceptable to whom? Ex acceptable to, Except to many, not necessarily me or anyone Not else. to the killers. No, not just to... For, just for knowing. Not, not to the, 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 the Ummah. And the Ahmadis, they're the most persecuted people in, in Pakistan. And, and they stand up for these jihadis. They debate me on Twitter all the time. I'm like, you're debating me? Why don't you debate your people's killers? Well, uh, you know what I mean? Why don't you stand with me? I mean, I just, and don't get That's, me started on Well, that was where Jasser. my question was going. Get to the specifically, question. Specifically, I wanted to get your views on these two people. Dr. Zudi Jasser, okay, he's, uh, his point that I walked away from was that he wants to have a separation between mosque and state. All right, but uh, he wasn't too 
readily accepting to, to go against anything that Muhammad did, such as slavery and, and murder. The um, killing of, of Jews and Christians was something relative only to those days and the fighting that was going on at that time. So I disagree with a lot that Dr. Zudi Jasser said, and I'm curious to know what your views are on Dr. Zudi Jasser and the Ahmadiyyan Muslim community, et cetera. And thank you for everything that you find folks do. Jasser represents Jasser. No, on this, because if you want to look into it, I debated, it went back and forth at the American thinker. Uh, he was replying to me, wrote articles, I was replying to him. Zudi Jasser lives in his own private Idaho, his own private Islam. He's lovely. I wish everybody was like Zudi Jasser. He has no constituency. He represents no one. I think he's dishonest when he says the Jew-hating hadiths are illegitimate. Really? According to whom? Oh, well, you want to tell that to the Muslim world? I mean, who cite the Jew-hating hadiths chapter and verse in Muslim and Arab media every single day? He's a lovely fellow, but I think he's dishonest. I think he, he gives people a false sense of hope. There's, there's no, there's no, uh, he doesn't have a theological leg to stand on. And as I said, the Ahmadis are seen as a radical sect outside of Islam. They are persecuted um, in Muslim countries. And so uh, it's like, you know, you're, you're trotting out the unicorn. Jonathan? Yes, uh, I met Zudi Jasser. He's a nice fellow, but Pam is right on the money. Zudi Jasser is just naive. He wants to reform Islam. So he's candy coating Islam. He thinks that Islam one day uh, can become peaceful. Uh, God bless him, but it ain't gonna happen. So, Bill? Very, very, very briefly, everybody in this room that is a Christian has one goal, one goal, and that is to be as much like our Savior Jesus Christ as they can be. Amen? Every true Muslim has one goal in life, to be as much like the prophet as they can possibly be. The prophet was a polygamist, a child molester, a murderer. Now, you, we, we can candy coat it all we want to. We can candy coat it. And we can pretend that it can be moderated. And perhaps it can in some places. But eventually, like we have had Christianity go wrong, but can go back to the words of Christ, good things can happen in Islam, but eventually they go back to the words of the prophet. And that is the problem. And by the way, very briefly, I was, one, I was in St. Sophia in Istanbul, and I had a guide going through it, and he was a moderate Muslim. And he said, our problem is that we have not had our Martin Luther. And I said, well, actually, that's not true. You've had many. The problem is you've killed every one of them. Let me just say, if I may, a word on, on Zudi Jasser's behalf. Uh, he is a friend of mine, and I admire his courage in saying what he says. I think he actually represents a lot of Muslims, the moderate Muslims that we keep hearing about, but who won't do what he does, which is stand up. But like them, he is selective in his adherence to the faith. And I think, candidly, he would acknowledge that if pressed on it. Um, there's no question, and I think we all certainly would agree, the faith is, as Erdogan says, the faith. It is captured and codified and enforced in the form of Sharia. And it's got all of that Jew-hating and all of that misogyny and all of that uh, jihadism absolutely codified in its DNA. And our hope, my hope at least, is that there will be more Zudi Jassers who say, well, I don't like that part. But tragically, at the moment, Pamela is right. He does not have anything like the following. And when he appeals to us to treat people like him as the representatives of the Muslim faith in America, not people like the Muslim Brotherhood, he's right. We're betting on the wrong horse. And we are strengthening it, and we're making the lot of those Muslims who might come down on our side impossible. We have one more question. But can I just say right one here. thing that's important in this conversation? Under Islam, if you attempt to reform Islam, you intend to reinterpret Islam, it is the crime of hypocrisy. It is the crime of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, like apostasy, is punishable by death. 
Yeah, you get around that. You, you get, around, get, get your arms around that. It and, makes reform impossible. And anybody can execute it. I saw the mic go somewhere in the middle. Just, there you are. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. First, I'd like to uh, thank you for asking the question you asked about the Saudi national. In case some of you folks are not familiar with Glenn Beck, he uh, is really pursuing this issue. He says he has uh, information that's been passed to all the uh, heads of all the networks and has given them to Monday to uh, put the story out and that he is going to release the information that he has, and that involves six congressmen. Now to my question. Frank, uh, it's off the subject, but what I'd like to know is in the NDAA, Section 1021 of last year's National Defense Authorization Act, does the President of the United States have the authority to arrest me off the street or not? And if he does, does he have the authority to use the military to do it? And can he use the military against U.S. citizens? Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this controversy, but uh, it is uh, certainly gotten a lot of attention in Washington and people that I know and respect and have confidence in and who drafted that legislation say the answer to those questions is no. Um, they are endlessly challenged and rebutted by smart people who have a different view and I think this is one of those cases where it probably comes down to, is it ever put into practice? But be honest with you, my concern is not so much that the president is going to cite the law to take action that is unconstitutional. I think he's doing it right now in a whole host of areas. And to that, he's actually thinking he's above the law. And, and going to a point that Pamela referred to about you know, our gun rights. This is really one of those defining moments, folks. When he says that the Senate acted shamefully by protecting those rights last week, and that he's going to do something about it, that ought to be something that I think is rather high up on our list of things to worry about. Uh, and I would put, personally, I would put that particular section of the law rather below that. Anybody else? Uh, I've got a lady right up here. Can we, oh, the mics keep getting to somebody else. Go ahead, sir. Uh, we then have in Jacksonville here. at our local university a professor like you. He's penetrated the press. Put, it, put that mic close to your mouth, sir. All right. We have Could you start over because we didn't hear, hear the beginning? In, in Jacksonville. In Jacksonville. This is a compliment yes, sir. and a question. Yep. Hold I that mic for that. I have a compliment to this church and First Baptist Church of Jacksonville. The pastor appears at the council meetings. I check the names and he's the only pastor. Uh, I suspect we have a couple others in Jacksonville. But secondly, uh, there's a local uh, member of a university is a former director in uh, CARE out of Washington. And he's able to, to attend all the council meetings he penetrates the press. He's currently advocating Sharia law. I guess my question is, are you as a professor available to debate him in the local college scene? Can you please repeat the question if I'm available? I, I, th I think we're going to have to move on. But the, the, the question, as I understood it, was about, uh, is it Parvez Ahmed? Is that the gentleman's name? Uh, Tom, Tom Trando's here. Uh, who would know, but th there is a gentleman who has been on the Human Rights Council, I believe, in Jacksonville and has been a matter of considerable controversy because he's exhibited some of that kind of behavior. And he's a member of CARE. And right. a member of yeah. CARE, many standing. Uh, and the question was, is that, is, is Professor uh, willing to debate this fellow? Is that As the question? As a university professor, are you able to come to our university and have a debate if we arrange one? I will do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Can we have the mic here, please? Thank you for taking my question. In the beginning, you guys were talking about the churches not speaking up. 
It's my premise that as long as the churches are afraid of their tax exemption status, that they will never speak up the way that they need to. I am sure, having lived in Jacksonville, that there is more than two or three pastors. I am sure where I live, there are some pastors because I go to a church. How can we get these pastors, the church of Jesus Christ, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers, to start taking a stand against Sharia law? Can I just mention one thing quickly by way of an anecdote? I was in uh, Oklahoma. The professor spoke about that state just recently. Um, yesterday, the governor of the state of Oklahoma signed into law the American Laws for American Courts legislation. So th this, is an, this is an important development because it just passed the House of Florida yesterday as well. And we need your help getting it through the Florida State Senate where it is currently being gummed up, as I understand it, by one individual. But I mention that because when I was there, I was hosted by a pastor by the name of Paul Blair who is a former uh, Chicago Bears offensive lineman, as I recall, who found a different calling. Marvelous guy. And he was telling me a story about an organization of which he is a part that has explicitly challenged that regulation. Actually making very political statements from the pulpit, recording them, and sending them, I think, to the FEC, the Federal Elections Commission, asking, you know, basically challenging them to prosecute. This is, this is a very important point, and it goes to what Jerry Boykin said so powerfully about the black robe regiments uh, that go to the very founding of this republic. Jonathan. Uh, to answer your question, are churches afraid to speak because they're afraid of losing their tax exam status? Uh, you will lose your tax exam status if you uh, openly endorse a candidate. If you say, vote for Barack Obama, vote for Mitt Romney, then you will lose your tax exam status. If you tell the truth on Islam, you will not lose it. Hey, let, let, let me add one thing without trying to offend too many people. Uh, this is the reality. The, the, losing your tax exempt status has nothing to do with it other than to be an excuse for weak pastors who are afraid to tell the truth from their pulpit. That, that, that's what it is. Let, let's just get honest about it. Thank you. Um, here. How about this lady right back here? And Pink, we're, we're just about out of time, so if you'll ask the question briefly, we'll try to answer it briefly. Um, I'm in high school, and I'm in an economics class, and this has kind of always intrigued me about the Islam. Um, like, in the religion where they, like the Boston, where they, they were younger, 1920s, are they like forced into this or if they deny it, like is there precautions if they don't fall into like their religion and you know, to be more like the prophet? First of all, I just want to thank you for being here. Yeah. Amen. You're young, you're beautiful and we need young people like you because it's your future that we're fighting so hard to save. Amen. Yes, there are penalties for leaving Islam. Uh, look, uh, many of us were involved in the fight to save Rifka Barry, a teenager out of Ohio who converted out of Islam, hid it from her family for oh, close to four years. Her mosque spied on her, ratted her out to the father who threatened to kill her. We see this all the time. And honor killings here in the States, you see uh, Nora Maliki, Amina and Sarah Saeed, uh, Asia Hassan. As Islam grows, so will these Sharia-related punishments. It's very, not all parents care. I've met, uh, I've met many Muslims who grew up in basically secular households, and they do what they want. They're not the problem. We're fighting to, to save their choice, to, to, be a part of, to be a part of it or not. But this kid, the aunt said, you know, everyone's talking about the spin. Perfectly lovely boy, such a lovely boy. He was so great, he was so great. That's what the media is saying. But the aunt said, the problem started when he recently became a devout Muslim. Very religious. We're, we're out of time and we're standing between you and lunch. I just wanted to make one last point on this very important question. When you hear people say, folks are becoming self-radicalized, don't believe it. 
they're talking to other people, whether it's through the internet or whether it is through their mosques. The Islamic Society of Boston is where the younger of these two guys was hanging, and that is one of the most virulently jihadist mosques in the United States. He wasn't self-radicalized. He became very religious under the tutelage and encouragement of Sharia adherent Muslims, and that is what they have in mind for all Muslims. And in due course, they have in mind imposing on us all as well. With that, we are at the end of our Frank, time. Frank, one, one final thing. Pamela, your website is? Oh. My website is atlasshrugs.com. You can go to PamelaGeller.com. Every day I upload that site 15 times a day with jihadi news. My book, The Post-American President, The Obama Administration's War on America is out there. My second book, Stop the Islamization of America, which is a practical guide to the resistance. You need that book. And then my last book, a collection of essays, Freedom of Submission, Islamic Extremism in, the, you know, in an Era of American Complacency. Get them all. Ours is securefreedom.org, and that video course, which is available for free, is muslimbrotherhoodinamerica.com. Our book is outside as well. And I have DVDs on the Islamic threat to America. It's only $4 right on the table. Thank you for being here. And, also, and I, have a, I have a newer uh, uh, one. It's Stop, Stop Saudi Evil. Stop Saudi Evil. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, guys.